Ready? Good afternoon and welcome to our session entitled Pathways to Prosperity for Communities of Color Through the Outdoors. Uh, my name is CJ Golding and I'm uh, the lead organizer for Fresh Tracks and I'll be the facilitator of this conversation but the highlight of this afternoon session is going to be uh, the four leaders who I have the honor of working with up here on this stage and the conversations that we hope will ensue between the four of them and also between, uh, between you all as well. Fresh Tracks is a coalition of public and private sector partners that have answered President Obama's call to support the connection of underserved or under-resourced youth to the outdoors, using uh, connection to the outdoors and cultural exchange as the platform for that development. Fresh Track started uh, in 2016 as a response to President Obama's visit to Alaska in 2015 and his uh, rededicated commitment to connecting youth of all, uh, of all backgrounds to the outdoors. Fresh Tracks is a partnership between uh, private public sectors. Uh, organizations like REI and the Campion Foundation have been generous supporters and other affiliations and organizations like the Center for Native American Youth Generation Indigenous and the My Brother's Keeper Alliance have been crucial and key partners in recruitment and in establishing what the program is like. <laughs> Initially, uh, so, you, so for those of you who haven't heard about Fresh Tracks or who have just seen the hats floating around campus this week and don't necessarily have uh, a, a, a con concrete idea of what it is, uh, initially, Fresh Track started with a two-week pilot expedition that brought two cohorts of leaders from Alaska and Los Angeles together to learn about each other's cultures and to explore the outdoors and the places where uh, these, the other leaders hailed from. Uh, this cultural exchange, which you'll hear a little bit more about from our panelists, uh, involved uh, these leaders understanding that there is a, a commonality that was shared even though uh, their cultures may have seemed different from the outset. This wasn't just, however, this just wasn't just a, a trip, uh, wasn't just a, a camp. Uh, evaluation from uh, this expedition and the programs that have happened since uh, have resulted in an increase, have shown an, an increase in the uh, individual leadership of the participants in the civic engagement of the participants in their connection to the outdoors and to nature. Um, and in their uh, involvement in impairing the outdoors and the work that they are doing in their community. Uh, I'm going to introduce, briefly introduce uh, the uh, panelists, our leaders here on, on, on the stage, and after that I will show a brief introduction, a, br a video over, overview of the Fresh Tracks pilot experience, and then we'll jump right in to start hearing from these leaders on uh, their experience connecting the outdoors and how it can be used as a platform for development and success. Uh, but again, thank you for spending time with us this afternoon and we hope we have uh, a very enlightening conversation. Part of our My Brother's Keeper program emphasis is really about a mentorship, exposure, 
um, and really connecting young people to new opportunities and fresh practices, all three of those, I think this really changes their perspective in a beautiful way. Well, I heard about Fresh Tracks because in my school, the co-founder was talking about it and uh, they sort of chose certain people and I was one of the people, a friend, he gave me a push and he said, Stephanie, you're smart, you know, you, you've got this and you're gonna go places. Forgive the technical difficulty. Well, with uh, that technical difficulty, we will, uh, Martin, if you could get the lights. If we have time and the technical difficulty is solved, we can uh, revisit the video or uh, share the link to where it's hosted so you can watch the rest of it. But with that being said, we'll jump into the reason why we're really here. Uh, the video is probably telling us that's enough. We actually want to hear from the people <laughs> sitting on the panel, and that's perfectly fine. We'll listen to uh, we'll listen to what the universe is telling us. Um, and so, uh, in front of us, we have Trenton Casillas Bayford, Kimberly Pickock, Peckock, apologies, Devin Edwards, and Israel, who uh, will be sharing a little bit about their who will be sharing about their work about how it pairs with Fresh Checks and about how they see the outdoors as a platform for continuing the work they're doing in their communities. Um, and so with their names being addressed, we'll go ahead and give them an opportunity to share a little bit more about themselves. Call me Doc Kelpie. Chante wa shite na pe chiu zapilo. Trenton kisi speak berge ma chapilo. La koi api gakhni gapi ma chapilo. Denise Casillas in a match up below. Ate, Leo Bakeberg, a match up below. One bleep haha, LYT, and over the tongue of the Makosha King Kumbi Kilo. So, my name is Trenton Casillas Bakeberg. Um, I come from the community of Eagle View, South Dakota. It's on the Shine River uh, Reservation in South Dakota. And um, I'm here, you know, representing my community, my reservation, and my people. It's, uh, I hope. Um, co-found the grassroots youth movement that was initially started to uh, address the youth suicide epidemic that was happening um, in the communities of our reservation and it's it's still happening but you know we're working on developing a safe house and um, you know for a, a safe space for these kids to go to and yeah that the the movement that I'm a part of is also the group that um, helped launch the the resistance at Standing Rock in the, from the, Go, the Dakota Access Pipeline. They ran to uh, Washington, D.C., getting signing petitions and stuff. And, you know, through that, I got connected to the Center for Native American Youth, who, you know, hooked me up with Fresh Tracks. And, you know, Fresh Tracks is the reason I'm here in front of you all. And it's an honor. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. My new fact name is Kivok. My English name is Kimberly Pekok. I am from Barrow, Alaska, but I go to school in Fairbanks at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, studying wildlife biology and conservation. I'm here with Fresh Tracks as a Fresh Tracks leader, and I'm also a part of the Arctic Youth Ambassadors Program, which was the program that introduced me to Fresh Tracks, and I'm also working with the Inuit Circumpolar Council. Good afternoon, my name is Devin Evans. Um, I became connected with Fresh Tracks because um, I'm born and raised in Boston, Mass. And Boston has a, a great um, MBK Boston, which is My Brother's Keeper, the national initiative that the president started. So through My Brother's Keeper, which I serve on the board, um, I'm also an ambassador. So I was connected through, um, to Fresh Tracks at the 2017 Train and Trainer Summit in West Virginia. It was a beautiful experience and we're we'll definitely gonna let you know all about it. Good afternoon, um, Israel Harris uh, from Denver, Colorado. We're for the Denver Metro Chambers of Commerce um, and Opportunity Youth. Uh, we serve uh, 
young adults in our community, 16 to 24, to help them get into internships, job opportunities. And um, through the Emergency Chamber of Commerce is how I got connected with Fresh Tracks through a partner who was connected with the organization. And I was able to take a trip out there and just get connected with nature and see the beauty of the work. Awesome. Uh, thank you all for being here. First question. So, uh, as I listed before in my uh, lengthy opening spiel about Fresh Tracks, uh, civic engagement, cultural exchange, and the outdoors are, are pretty big parts of what Fresh Tracks is. Um, but, in your, but in your experience, not from my words, in your experience, how have you seen those things like play out in how Fresh Tracks, how Fresh Tracks works? Um, for me, um, one of the great experiences at, um, when I went to Fresh Tracks was a culture night. So we had uh, people from different environments share their culture and share their experience. So there's uh, people, they showed us how to speak in their native tongue and you know, we were able to relate and just like kind of step out of that box to like know that it's just not your world, there's other people's experiences too. Yeah, I, I was gonna build off what Israel said. Um, before going to the trainer summit, um, I had never even seen a deer, um, seen a grasshopper, <laughs> no, a groundhog. I thought that was just you know, one day on TV, I've seen groundhogs, and we've seen groundhogs all day, every day in um, West Virginia. So, yes, um, that coming from the city is definitely a, a major difference, um, seeing the wildlife out there. And then the, the National Conservation Training Center, which is a federal facility that's beautiful and just definitely being well taken care of. Um, it was just great to be out there and see the wildlife, and, you know, hands on, something which I'm foreign to back home. No, if you want to, I'm not going to acquire yours. So it was really, um, during the, the expedition, we went to our village and we spent a lot of time outside and I was on a four-wheeler with this guy named Donald who's a local resident at Arctic Village and this girl named Sierra. She's from Los Angeles area and we were heading back to the place we were staying at and the driver of the four-wheeler, he was hunting for squirrels, and then Sierra saw <laughs> Donald shoot a squirrel, and then she started to freak out, and then I told her, like, it's part of their culture, it's what they do, they have to eat it to survive, so it was pretty cool witnessing that she, witnessing that experience. Mm -hmm. Like, I got to tell someone, like, you shouldn't judge people based off of, like, killing an animal, but it's just for survival. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like like what you said, you know, because I've seen the same, like in um, in my culture, uh, this is gonna sound a bit odd, but we have puppy soup, <laughs> and uh, yeah, that that's a real thing. Like um, when I first heard about it, I was like, what? Like we actually eat puppies? And yeah, like like you know, so it was the same for me, but it's my own culture, you know, like just growing up learning about it. I never knew. I think I even ate it once or twice. Um, <laughs> that that was a shock, kind of like. Um, yeah, I mean, in, in other people's eyes, you know, that seems that seems kind of unethical, but you know, like it's it's been like that for a long time, you know, prior to before I was born, before my mom and grandparents was born, these are just the the traditions, and so sharing that with other people, uh, as bizarre as it may seem, it it's good to hear about other people's cultures as long as you're able to take them in in like an unbiased way. It it's good to keep your mind open, and I mean, yeah, you know, it's just. That's what Fresh Tracks is, is good for, you know, because not only is it an outdoors experience, you know, you're meeting people who are from all around, you know, and it's just like a bonding experience. Like, this is my brothers and sisters right here after spending a, well, a week with them in West Virginia. Like, that changed my life, you know. Now I have connections, you know. I, you know, can really hear from Alaska and Devin from um, Boston, Israel from Denver. Like, like, I got friends everywhere now, thanks to Fresh Tracks. And, you know, it's, it's really cool, honestly. Uh, I didn't make them say I'm not making them say any of this, by the way. <laughs> just, just letting you know. Just saying, I haven't seen any of their responses. Um, uh, Kimberly, uh, you were talking about that initial experience uh, in Alaska, and so uh, you were a part of that first group, that pilot, uh, that pilot, uh, that pilot two-week program, mm -hmm. um, and uh, the other three gentlemen on the panel have been a part of the trainer summit that happened earlier this summer in July in Washington, D.C. Uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about that that first experience and what it was like the traveling between two places? America? The LA and Alaska. Oh, <laughs> it was an adjustment. 
adjustment for me because I'm not, I'm not a big fan of huge cities. They scare me. There's a lot of people. People scare me because I'm smiling. As I walk down the street, I have like the biggest smile, but everyone else has like the sternest face ever. Like, what's there to be mad about? <laughs> and then another big problem for me was the heat. Um, before I went to Fresh Tracks, it was kind of the end of whaling season, so I ate a lot of blubber before I went, so I was already packed with some kind of fat. <laughs> and then one really strange experience that really like opened my eyes was experiencing Los Angeles, because I've only seen Los Angeles in the movies and TV shows, but once you actually get there, my perception has changed, because I always thought that California was just a dangerous state with guns and drugs. And I don't know, I was just really scared of going to California because I thought that I was gonna get shot or get taken away, but <laughs> it's actually a really cool place and I really <laughs> wanna go back to California. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm glad. Uh, and it, the, the, there are no representatives here uh, on the panel from the Los Angeles crew, but uh, you did learn. You, we talked. We talked about how you learned some lessons uh, from from them, or how there, even though you, there's these differences that were on the outside, that there are things that you all found in common. Can you expand a little bit on that? And before we go to the next question, um, we had a lot of deep conversation about what's going on in our communities. Like I found some similarities in my community and in their community. Like there was drug and alcohol abuse, suicide, and. Some communities even have like homelessness and that's starting to be a big thing where I'm from. So it's just really cool connecting with those people that have the, those same issues because then we can just come together and then try to solve them, you know, as a family. <laughs> awesome. Uh, so hopping to this summer in July and the Trainer Summit, uh, let's, I, I'm curious, what, what were some of the favorite experiences that you had uh, during that time you spent in West Virginia? I would say, um, upon arriving to West Virginia, I kind of prepared myself. I said, listen, it's going to be very different from the city life. Um, you're going to see things in which might scare you, and I definitely did. So um, just being head on with two deers, you know, after the first day that I seen two deers, I was comfortable with seeing them every day, and I <laughs> started you know, going towards them now, then I actually run away from them. So that just overcoming that fear of being uh, in front of the wildlife, um, and just being out in, you know, in nature where you see fireflies, um, you got you know, bugs that jump at you, um, just being in that environment, uh, it was definitely great. My favorite part at Fresh Tracks um, was going kayaking for the first time. Mm -hmm. I cannot swim. Um, you know, being born and raised in the city, especially Boston, um, it was more to get in, you know more things to get into than you know, swimming, you know biking. I do biking, um, but I would say kayaking for the first time was definitely my best experience. I overcame that fear. Um, I kayaked alongside Israel. So <laughs> Israel sitting there laughing. I said, I said Israel, if you tip this over, I'm gonna get out of here. Israel's laughing. Israel's over there laughing, and I'm like, listen. I cannot swim, brother, but I'm, I'm here. Like, I'm here. We're gonna paddle to the closest, to the closest dock, and we're gonna get off. But um, it was a good experience. We had, actually had a little rap session in the Potomac River, uh, so you can see how comfortable I got at that point um, to allow me to rap. Because when you rap, you get you know you get into it, you start fidgeting, and the, the kayak was kind of you know shaking back and forth. And I'm just there like, okay, okay. But yeah, so it was definitely a great experience on um, kayaking for the first time. Also, um, I would say. Another great part of the Trainer Summit was um, the culture change. Um, we got, um, I was very you know, naive to the fact that my brother here, Trenton, um, lives on you know, a reservation. I'm coming from a city in which I'm you know, very fortunate. Um, you know, water's you know, at my, you know, I get water whenever I may need to. Um, he, his you know, reservation control their water, their food, and things of that nature. So just being able to, um, be, be in a know of that, um, it was definitely a, a strong impact on me because I, I then, you know, we tend to always think about those less fortunate than us and, and that was a situation in which I, I became grateful of the life that I had lived back home in Boston. Mm -hmm. Oh, I thought Israel was going to tell us about how he tried to tip down over <laughs> oh, the guy. <laughs> <laughs> if you would have tipped over, I would have saved him. <laughs> he obviously knows that. That was the plan, yeah. <laughs> 
But no, uh, that was actually my favorite experience too. I've never been kayaking either. I was scared too, but I had to learn a little different. Uh, I would say my best experience though that I kind of kept to myself was being able to go outside and see the stars. Like I'm a big thing about like seeing the stars and like very impressed about the sky. So I was able to go out and like the city was in like fogging up the lights, you know, I was able to see the stars and just like go out there and reflect and just think for a minute. And like that was beautiful. Like and it's crazy when you're in nature, if you're you're with like by yourself, it's like quiet. Like you hear nothing. It's like the first time you could sit in silence. Like you could literally hear like a tree grow or something. Like it's that quiet. <laughs> so that was my favorite experience. Uh try to yeah, yeah, that. The, the whole thing of fresh tracks is my favorite, but you know, like you said about seeing the stars, I love the stars too. I mean, I see them every night where I live, right? Because there's no big cities around. But the one thing that I don't see every day is forests. Like, because I live on a prairie, you know? And we got, we got trees here and there, but forests are scarce on the prairie. It's just all flat, you know, grassland. And like, being in West Virginia for a week, it was nothing but forests. And being able to walk amongst it, you know, feel that energy, you know, it's a really sacred place, I feel like. And, um, you know, all the fresh oxygen, you can almost taste it, you know, like going from like Los Angeles to the forest of West Virginia is a big difference in the air quality. And um, it, was, it was really cool. And, you know, seeing all the all the wildlife, like like Devin said, seeing deer, like you, you literally walk by them on the sidewalk when we were there, like that was cool. And um, what else was there? There's, there's oh yeah, when we when we went to the river, the kayaking was also my favorite experience too. You know, I never, I'd never gone kayaking either. And we were like seeing fish, you know, swim along the shoreline and ducks and stuff. And it was just a really immersive, um, engaging experience in nature. And I, I learned a lot, had a lot of fun. Awesome. So all of you have mentioned this idea of seeing something different in nature or meeting different people or new people and being introduced to new cultures. Uh, in our country today, people are trending, I say people, not meaning the majority of people, but people are trending towards uh, staying isolated in their own groups, talking to people who believe the same things they do, who uh, look the same way they do, speak the same language, have the same culture. Um, but you all have talked about the benefits of, of, of new or benefits of being in the space where that happens. Uh, why touch, I, I'm inviting you to touch briefly on why you believe that it's important. Why do you believe it's important to reach out to, the, uh, to someone else, someone different, to have those different experiences? Um, I guess I can speak on that a little bit. Um, I, I believe it's important just because like, like even like coming from skin color, religion or whatever, I feel like we're all the same, you know what I mean? So for us to share that experience with other people as humans and like, you know, it's a beautiful thing when you go into a different environment and like you're not closed minded, like you open your mind to that experience. Like you probably go to like Mexico and learn Spanish talking to someone or like, I don't know, like I feel like you grow each time you, you connect with someone that you didn't know was from a different background. Or you could have like certain stereotypes. You could look at someone and that might not even be the race that you're thinking they are until you talk to them and you really get to know a person. Yeah, for sure. And like that, like when that happens, it, it almost like reveals something about yourself, you know, so it's a learning experience. And um, I think it's really important, you know, to meet new people somewhat regularly. Because for me, like living on a reservation, I'm really cut off from the outside world. I mean, I see what I see on social media. I don't really watch the news too much, but um, yeah, when it comes to like like outside events, I don't know what's going on. And so when I have a chance to go out there and meet new people and connect with them, you know, especially on such an intimate level as I have with these three, you know, it, it really helped me learn and grow as a person. And I'm, you know, I'm really grateful for that. I would say um, being um, African-American and also of you know, Puerto Rican descent, um, I touched base on how, you know, I don't know how to swim, um, and that is because, you know, back home, we didn't, you know, when I was a youth, you know, how to swim wasn't, wasn't a thing, you know, we were figuring out how to eat, you know, how to make it to school, how to, um, have funds to make it to and from school, um, how our mother would, um, how my mother would not, you know, be able to go to work and how I'd be able to go finish my little sister, so there was bigger, you know, bigger fish we had to fry, um, and, and which is why I wasn't able to connect with nature, but on um, Fresh Tracks, brings that out and um, it connects those, um, me, you know, I was born of, of nature, it connects me to that and um, in a greater sense in which I can, you know, engage with my counterparts here and it's also fun in a way. Julie, do you want to add on to that or do you want to answer the next one? I can answer the next one. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, uh, Fresh Tracks, 
uh, the program we've been discussing, we're making a transition here. This is because this focus of this, we wanted to highlight their involvement in Fresh Tracks, but that's not the focus of our conversation today. The focus is on, on these leaders, the work that they're doing in their communities, the collaboration that they, they're working in and completing, and uh, how we can learn lessons and share best practices where that's concerned. And so uh, I called you all leaders, not just because I'm being nice to you, but because you have a track record of things that you've done in your community. And Fresh Tracks, is just a pit stop on on the on your resume. So you've already accomplished other things. So give uh, the folks who are in the audience, give our, our, our friends here a little. I'm asking to give them a little bit of a taste of your development as a leader, um, leader, and what you the impact you plan on having in your communities. And uh, I believe we'll start with you. So believe it or not, I used to be like the shyest person in my school until like freshman year of high school when I started to get involved with student council and um, what did I do? Yeah, just student council and then I got accepted into a geology program. It's a four-year geology program called GeoForce and we traveled throughout the United States so I had to play a leadership role within the small groups that I was in and then GeoForce um, got me into the Arctic Youth Ambassador Program, which is an Alaska-based program for Native youth to voice their concerns in the Arctic. And then thanks to the Arctic Youth Ambassador Program, I was in, in fresh tracks, but all in between that, I have a really close tie with my grandparents and my dad, and they really pushed me to be a leader because my great I mean, my, uh, what's the English word for it? My grandfather, he was, sorry, <laughs> he was in, uh, what's it? I don't know the English word for tell this. Us, tell us, tell us. Tell us the word. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, he was in this movement called uh, the Barrow of Ducking, which happened in 1961, and it was with the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, and the Native people, they weren't allowed to hunt ducks at the time, even if it was for subsistence, because the government would not let them hunt ducks for food because it was like off season, I guess. So what my author did, he got he got arrested and same for this guy named Johnny Sunganya. And they my office family, they came together and then they got the whole community together to protest against the fish and game and the US Fish and Wildlife Service. So the whole community together, they got 350 ducks. They showed up at the game warden's hotel and then they like dangled the ducks in front of him. So the game warden was like forced to have everyone sign a paper saying that they caught these ducks off season and then the, that they're gonna go to jail. But the game warden did not have enough papers. So <laughs> he kind of dipped barrel and the natives like, they won. <laughs> <laughs> Not the paper. <laughs> so, I think my alpha and my dad and, you know, just my whole dad side of the family, my inner back side of the family, they really pushed me to become a leader, and I really appreciate it. <laughs> and uh, you talked about the, I'm not going to. I have inside information that I'm not going to share with you share. You talked about the specific things that you want to have an impact on uh, at, at, as a result of that legacy of leadership. Uh, what are some of those things like? Close into some what some of those things are. So this past summer, I was working with the New Week Circumpolar Council, which is a working group and a permanent participant of the Arctic Council. And what they do is, I say NPC. Sorry. No, you said you said. Uh, I need a circumpolar council. Okay, what they do is, um, it was made in Barrow by Evan Hobson, and he wanted to make an organization that connects Inuit from all of the circumpolar regions, like Greenland, Canada, Russia, and Alaska. So I was able to work with such a very high-end organization that brought Inuit together, which was it was amazing, but what I did over there, so I was an intern, and interns are assigned a project, and my project was based off of the strategic plan of involving education, youth, and technology. So what I did, I made an educational TV show for little kids, 
I mean, I create a storyboard and a script and an outline, and I incorporated the different stories that each region has from like the different countries, and I made sure that each of the episodes or like each of the segments had something that encompasses all of the different regions together, like what makes us connected. So I incorporated common traditional stories, foods, animals, clothing, land, Inuit values, and even like names of relatives, siblings, like common names within the region. So that was an exciting project. Awesome. Uh, Devin, we'll go to you next, and then we'll come to you. All right. So, um, I would describe uh, my life in the past three years um, as an overwhelming change. Um, and it's you no know, change for the better, definitely. Um, at, at one point, I felt I was, as though I was a leech in my community. I was definitely um, a negative, you know, between dealing drugs, you know, running into the law. Um, so I, I always took away from my community. I never, you know, contributed on like a positive manner um, and now I, I definitely do so but one day I just had a you know I woke up one day and I said listen um, things got to change I need something more long term um, I'm struggling day to day you know temporary job temp services um, so I ran across the an internship called Operation Exit um, which is back home in Boston they have a Operation Exit which is like an internship program in which they set you up um, with the uh, corporations um, local government chiefs or commissioners, um, for you to intern with them. And this is paid internship, um, have been for, and, and Operation Exit is definitely just an a internship for, you know, as they say, those heavy hitters in the neighborhood that are, are being, you know, uh, not affecting in an improper manner, um, running into the law, dealing drugs and such, and things which I've done. So I ran into Operation Exit. After being Operation Exit for about a year, I interned with the uh, Chief of Health Human Services. I was his executive assistant. Um, I then learned learned the whole deal of the community health centers, the teaching hospitals, all of that. Um, I learned a little bit of definitely some more professionalism. Um, and then, as I was working with the government, I started to believe in the government. Um, prior to working for the government, I, de I definitely didn't believe believe in them because poli police brutality, um, the things I was facing in my community, um, you know, seeing my brothers and sisters just being bashed on I mean, it, and it, was, it wasn't something in which I was proud of. But um, that internship got me connected with My Brother's Keeper, which is the National Initiative the President started. Um, my Brother's Keeper has brought me all the way to North Carolina, Greensboro, to speak at um, North Carolina A&T University, um, in front of the President on, on ESPN, um, to, to be able to ask him a question and say, what are you gonna continue to do for boys and young men of color, like myself, who come from you know, troubling upbringings, and, and and also, we don't have these you know, proactive opportunities exposed to us. Um, what are you going to continue to do for us? And um, he definitely answered that question. Um, and now I find myself here three, three years later, you know, being a, a, a positive contributor to my community rather than a leech. Um, I'm working for you know, a state representative back home now. I'm a legislative aide. So in a matter of three years, I would say that my, t my life took an overwhelming change, but definitely for the better. You know? um, and now I'm on the other side, as I say, I'm definitely um, giving back as much as I can. Um, my other counterparts, my friends and my family members see that change in me. And it's definitely one of those things in which you know you just lead by example kind of. But um, it's not easy because then you have those folks saying, Devin, you're not, you know, you turned on us, you're not us no more. Like, but it's also saying, no, I've been presented this opportunity and so can you. Um, so let's see how we can get you into this opportunity and see how we can get you from being, you know, at least the community to a positive contributor. I feel like I can relate with that. I come from two different places. He's from Boston, I'm from Denver. But three years ago, I was in like a similar situation. Um, I was dropped out of school, uh, was with, hanging out with the wrong crowd, got myself incarcerated, uh, missed an internship opportunity that well, I thought that I missed out on. Uh, sure enough, coming out of the incarceration, went to the place, the place was called Youth on Record, which is a nonprofit that helps uh, young adults um, get studio time, uh, get credit for their music and um, pays them for their time. And I went there and sure enough, I was running in classes of 16 and 17 year olds in high school and didn't have no formal education myself. 
But um, that pushed me to go back to school and uh, get my GD at Henry Kirk High School. And through that opportunity, um, I was able to open the doors uh, for an internship at the Denver Metro Chamber of Commerce. So I did a, a year internship of uh, event planning. So was planning events like the networking event we had yesterday, last night. Was able to get a little bit into that. And it helped me build on my leadership skills too. And like just switch my uh, state of mind. Uh, you would not catch me like this, probably. That was weird. <laughs> <laughs> You'd see me in a t-shirt and jeans, like. <laughs> so, uh, but it, you know, it helped me grow and just develop, like you know, the way that I want to present myself and the way I want uh, my friends in, in my community also to be leaders too. And uh, which brings me to my next journey is Fresh Tracks and being involved with this organization. Like since I went back, I would say I've been to the mountains in Denver, like seven or 20 times already. <laughs> Call for, like, it's a crazy number. Like, I don't even know. I'd be calling my friends. I'm like, yo, bro, we're going on a hike. <laughs> it's six o'clock in the morning. Like, bro, we're going on a hike. Yeah, I'll, I'll buy the water bottles. <laughs> or get them from Mario. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> or that. <laughs> but yeah, it's because, like, um, it, it really is, like, tough, like, growing up in a city or just, like, an environment when you don't have an outlet, you know? Cause there's like always like all these like drugs, you know, bad neighborhood, cop police brutality. You know, there's all these barriers that bring us down. But I feel like as you open those doors and that opportunity, as Devin was saying, and actually take a chance to like try something different. Like I've learned being uncomfortable is like the best way to be comfortable. <laughs> like when you're in a situation that you don't want to be in, it's like you can really grow from it. And that's I feel like that's what stems from my leadership. If that answers your question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I'll you want to repeat the question. I can yeah, 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 yeah sure, real quick. absolutely. Uh, so again, Fresh Tracks does not take credit for making you a leader. You were a leader before, and you will continue to be a leader after. So, uh, inviting you to share a little bit with uh, the rest of the folks in here about mm -hmm. uh, your journey and development as a leader. Mm -hmm. I see. I mean, I would say I'm just still a leader in the making. You know, I'm still learning. I mean, there was a time when I like I just like playing video games more than real life. You know, back when I was in school and stuff. And then one day I just kind of grew up a little bit and I opened my eyes and I saw the world around me, like on the reservation. I realized, you know, like part of my, my family is like addicted to drugs and the other part is uh, real bad alcoholics. And, and there's a reason for that. So I started to do my research and look into it. And I found out that it stems from, you know, the cultural oppression and social indoctrination that my ancestors experienced in the boarding schools, you know, being forced on the reservation, all the genocide that happened to indigenous peoples that still resonates in my generation to this day. I mean, I feel the pain of my ancestors, and I see that there's a reason why my peers like to abuse substances. You know, we have a really high substance abuse problem in my, in my communities, and you know, a lot of drug and alcohol abuse too. I mean, I'm not immune from it too. I, I've stumbled a few times, and I've learned from those experiences. And so, what I'm, what I'm really passionate about is paving a path for the kids younger than me, you know, to learn from my mistakes and the mistakes of my peers. So then, you know, they don't have to go through um, any kind of treatment or getting taken away from their family, you know, for breaking laws or anything, because that's, it, it's a dark path, you know, when you, when you really, like, been on a reservation and, and you see the life that we live, like, it's, like, we're struggling every day. You know, I, I live in Zeebok County, which I believe, as of a couple years ago when I read it, it was the second poorest county in the whole nation of the United States. So... Um, I just want to help my community and you know like <clears throat> two and a half years ago when when I helped uh, co-found the one mind youth movement which uh, it, it was like it was my friends uh, Joseph White Eyes and Jason Lynn Charger um, Robin LeBeau she's like an older mentor but yeah we're all youth and we wanted to address the, the, the suicide epidemic that was happening on our reservation and there was like there was like a really like chronological like like it was like a suicide pact that happened at one time and like there were like four different girls that took their life in the span of one week and they were all in, like in middle school and high school and that just rocked my community like there were so many funerals happening at once and so we decided to host a candlelight vigil which has never been done in my town and it was the first thing and we organized it in four days you know we asked the churches for candles as donations um, we designed a poster printed it off and put them up around town and within four days we were able to notify the community and we had a turnout of at least 150 people that came. And we, um, you know, we, we marched 
you know, from the cultural center downtown into Main Street. We had a little gathering there, like a rally, where we sang and prayed, you know, shared music, um, just spread the love. And from that, you know, the idea of a youth safe house stemmed. And so now that's what we're currently working on in my community is, you know, finding a place for this youth safe house to happen because it's been an idea for like two years now, but it hasn't happened. I don't know. <clears throat> There's something holding up. They, they tried giving us a building, you know, to occupy, but came to find out that that building had asbestos in it, mold, and there's not a lot of, like, <clears throat> new structures on my reservation either. Like, the newest thing is a movie theater, you know, so it, it's cool. We got a movie theater, but something that's, I mean, a movie theater is just to escape reality, you know, like, I'm, I work here currently, actually. I'm a cinema technician, but I want to not distract people. I want people to realize that we need to see life, these challenges and face them. And in order to do that, you know, we need to um, create safe spaces for our youth to be, for them to have mentors, people to talk to, you know, when they can't be at home because, you know, their family is, you know, having problems or they're drinking and fighting and, and like, all this stuff is what weighs on a child, which is what makes them contemplate suicide. And that's, I really want to just find a way to heal that from the root of it. And that's, that, that's what I'm doing. And I, I'm, I, like I said, I'm, I'm just a leader learning. I'm still, like... I'm not there yet, you know, but I'm, I'm inching closer the more that I, I, uh, I work towards these things and, and um, yeah, the more that I, I, uh, I just, you know, connect with the youth of my reservation, I, I find them out. I find out what's wrong, you know, what, what can I do on a personal level? And that's, I mean, it's, it's real tough and it's emotional, you know, when you speak to them and actually, you know, hear what happens in their homes, you know, because I just want to be there for them, but we can't be um, in multiple places at one time. So it's it's interesting, you know, to to be a, a young person trying to take on all these things. Sometimes I just want to go back to video games. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I know from experience that you don't you don't hide from that. You don't always go back to video games. What is one of the tools that you use to one influence your community and also to support yourself in in uh, in, in your leadership? Like when you hit those tough mm -hmm. spots, what, is, what are the, some of the tools? One of the tools that you use. Uh, well, I mean. For that? <clears throat> Like one of my, like I guess you want to call it coping mechanisms, I, I love to write. And so I've been into writing since I was like a little kid. Eventually it turned into poetry when I was in junior high and then during high school I really took a liking to hip hop music and so I started writing raps as well. And nowadays I, I, uh, I use that as like a, a platform. I don't see myself as a rapper, I see myself as a messenger. You know, and I use the, the um, that's his rapping. That's his, uh, yeah. not rapping, yeah. his messenger partner. Anyways, I, I use the, you know, the, the words, the weaving of the words to, to send a message, to, to speak to the youth of my community and, you know, of other reservation youth too. Um, I want them to know that they're not alone in these struggles. You know, when I'm feeling down and I'm thinking crazy things, I just, I write it out, you know. I find a way to channel that pain and um, I, I wanted to teach the, the kids in my reservation how to do that, you know, because it's, it's, it's a lot healthier than, you know, abusing substances and drinking, you know, to cover our pain and stuff. And so um, I organized a, a creative writing hip hop workshop, and I was just um, August 24th and 25th, um, and I had a good turnout. It was my first time doing any kind of workshop, and I had 10 kids that came for both days, and it was, it was a lot of fun. We had a lot of fun. We connected, and they learned, you know, like how I got into. Um, you know, writing music and poetry and everything, and like it was just really cool to be being able to be hands on with the youth of my of my uh, community and give them that experience. And they, I learned a lot from them too. You know, just like even my next door neighbor showed up. She's like a little girl, and um, you know, we're we're good friends now. Every time I see her, I say hi. <laughs> I, I, I look forward to to doing more stuff like that. Um, at this moment, we are going to pivot. We have a couple of questions dashed away, but we'll use them if uh, the time is, is if, we, if we need to. Uh, but I want to make this not a, a up here conversation, not a conversation amongst us. I want to open it up uh, to our fellow uh, community members in the room uh, to ask questions of our leaders uh, and to get some of responses. If there's anything you would like to know more about or anything that you've heard that uh, connects with some of the work that you're doing in your community. Uh, we'll take some time for questions from the audience. Uh, then we will uh, we'll break for a, a group uh, discussion activity. And if, uh, if he's willing, if they're willing, we'll, we'll close out with 
uh, some uh, spoken words and final messages. Sure. I mean, if you guys want to hear a poem that I wrote. You're here. Yeah. And is that cool? We'll, yeah. Close, yeah. we'll, close, it, we'll close off with we'll that. Does that mean you got to stay? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is there any questions for any of us? Uh, go ahead and say your, uh, when you're uh, asking the question, go ahead and say your name, introduce yourself, so, uh, and then uh, where you're coming from. Sure, yeah, so my name is Marty Malloy, I'm with Youth Build Philadelphia, and uh, I think that's already been said, you guys had, you guys were already leaders, right? And so with a lot of the young people that we all serve in one capacity or another, uh, oftentimes, whether it's through a gentle nudge or a small recruitment of mentor or whatever, those leaders emerge. Right? I mean, Devin, you were going to emerge no matter what. I think that the hard part, though, is how and what techniques have any of you used specifically to bring together a circle of influence, right? And I, I mean, Israel, you talked a little bit about it. Hey, we're going on a hike, whatever. But what I found at Youth Build is, especially with our young men, not to, to exclude you from the conversation, but especially with our young men, that the, the sphere of influence and the power that they have on their peers is huge. When that cycle is spiraling up, oh my God, amazing things happen. And sometimes when that's, that spiral is going down, then it's, it's really tough. So what are some of the techniques and things that you use to bring in more into your circle of influence? Um, I guess I could just take this one off. Um, I guess it's that peer mentoring so like being that influence, like sometimes like you could have a friend and like let's say Devin for example, he's like a new recruit I bring in. He might not you know really connect with CJ at the moment, but then he he sees sorry. <laughs> 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 but they, they could, but like you know, but he sees me as his mentor at the moment. You know what I mean? So I could lead him through the program. You know that peer mentoring I, I feel is like real critical. But when you have that, so when Devin says to you though that first time, like, man, no, that's corny. What's your next? What's your next move? You I'll know, be like honestly, I thought it was corny too, <laughs> but I took the experience, you know, because like everyone does feel that, like you don't want to try something at first, or you know, mm-hmm. you feel like it's, uh, it's a little weird, but like you know, just like make them feel comfortable and make them understand that you felt the same thing as them. Like they're not the, like, the only ones going through that. Mm-hmm. I would say, um, for me, it's more so. Just giving back, um, going into the spaces in which people know me, um, in the community, um, elementary schools, middle schools, high schools, in which I, you know, graduated from, um, you know, community centers in which I played basketball at, um, just um, the, you know, the neighborhoods I've hung out in. Um, folks just hearing, you know, my transformation, um, hearing my story, I usually, you know, I try to, you know, tell folks of my age, you know, the 16 to 24 bracket that, you know, if I did it, you can do it. Um, you know, th- this is something in which we just need the tools, and then we'll run with it. Um, but to definitely um, just you know speak on your experience, on the, the numerous experiences I've had up until now, and how that's has affected me going forward. Um, you know, for instance, like I only got my GED. I'm uh, I, now I'm in my second year at a community college, going for my human service degree. Um, so for you know my you know my friends and family to see that I'm enrolled in college now. Um, that is, you know, something in which I say like, I lead by experience. You know, that they, by example, they definitely all right. I'm gonna take some cl- classes now because I see you're doing so. That is, you know, bettering you as a person. Um, and I, I feel like that is the the biggest impact that I've done so far. Is just giving back and telling people that what I've been through um, and, and my process. Process isn't gonna happen overnight, um, but it's, you gotta be willing. You have to have the mindset, and you have you wanna have to change for the better. Um, you, have, you just have to just get out of that 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 life. I was asking, my name is Corey Winfield, I'm out of the I'm out of Sage Street for now. Um, my, my, I, I would like for you, Devin, to really explain and, and to the people, right, um, the process it took for you and the opportunity that where the door opened because a lot of people feel like, as the, as the brother said over here, that you would, you would evolve anyway, but that is not true coming from the background from which we come from. Unless someone is able to open the door for you, for you to pass through, you're never going to get that. That's that's the tip. That's the way it's like. Yeah. So, if, could you explain that to the audience? Who, how that came about, and for you to be in the position that you are in now, and also always remember this: that you are an incredible messenger. So that's what you bring to your people, your peers. 
you are a credible messenger. You are credible because you are where they are trying to be and they see you as that one step at a time and you can show them the steps by opening the door like someone else can do. So I would say um, the reason in which I, you know, I work for the Commonwealth now is because of numerous internships at the city level. Um, I went to an internship called Resilient Coders where you have an eight week boot camp where they teach you how to code um, and it, it's a paid internship. Um, now I learned how to build apps, um, websites, break codes, put codes together. After that eight weeks, I realized that you know computers just wasn't for me. Breaking that code, um, having a headache because of one semicolon throwing off your whole code um, was just not something I really wanted. Um, even though it's a very demanding field, I did not want it at that moment. Um, so then I was definitely referred to another internship called Operation Exit um, Professional Pathways, in which I interned for um, a chief of health and human services at the city level. Um, through that internship, um, you know, based on you know how I performed, they um, after a year they brought me on as a full time employee, um, as ex executive um, assistant, and then um, in that year I gained you know so much experience and just knowledge on what is going on in the city, how things you know how you know street lights get put up, how you know streets get paved, you no know, things just don't happen overnight like that. Um, you know, you have to put processes in, calls, emails. A lot of things going back and forth. People say, no, the street is not yet ready to be paved. Um, we're going to wait off until it's ready to be paved. So I would say numerous internships and then um, becoming a full-time city employee. And then after I become a full-time city employee, I, I was definitely um, brought on board as a, a board member. Um, I, I look at myself as a product of my brother's keeper because my brother's keeper was um, the funding in which um, allowed me to partake in all those internships. Um, but through those internships, I definitely, you know, grew that, you know, the career development, and, and just I grew as a per as a person. And then seeing brothers and sisters around me who looked like me, who are, were in, you know, powerful positions, who were saying, you know, I've done it, you know, it is possible. So just, you know, learning from them, and then, you know, having that motivation in which I can reach their level at some point, um, was be definitely impactful for me. So I would say, you know, internships to become a, you know, full time city employee to now, you know, working for the state of Massachusetts. Um, that, that's how that path has led to me where I'm at now. Uh, I, 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 do you have a question? Uh, yeah, could I'll, you step one step back farther it, from the moment where you were engrossed in the activities you were engrossed in in your neighborhood and that first opportunity? And who was that that gave that to you? And how did it find yeah. you in the hood? Okay, so, um, as, as I said, you know, I was a drug dealer. I was always in the hood. Um, I was always in the hood. So you always, if you already know a, an official or, or you know a police officer or you know a street worker, which is how I became connected to the internship, you know where to find me. Um, you know where to come to the to in front of the corner store and find Devin because Devin will be there. Um, so one day, uh, a friend of the family who actually um, was a street worker as well in Boston, we have a program called a street worker program. So they go into these neighborhoods. They go into the hood. Um, they target those heavy hooders in, in the neighborhoods and say, listen, this is not you, Mom. I have this opportunity for you. Do you want to, you know, do you want to take it on? Um, so one day, uh, Maria, which is my street worker, she's also a friend of the family, um, saw me, you know, basically in diapers. Um, she said, Devin, you, you're, you know, you have potential. Um, this is not you. She said, I have this coding program, and which is how I became involved with the Brazilian Coders program. She said, I want you um, to think about this. Um, I want you to, to, to take it on. I said, well, yeah, you know, I'm up to nothing now. I'm just out here hanging in the streets, you know, making an income of myself, because um, that's the only way I knew how to make up income, but, you know, having just a GED and, and, and being, you know, heavily involved in, the, in the law enforcement down there. Um, so, Maria um, came the next day. She said, you're going to be here tomorrow, right? I said, you know where to find me. Um, and so, so she came the next day. She had a whole bunch of paperwork. She said, this is what I want to present to you. Um, and it was Brazilian code. She said, Read it, um, fill it out, and return return it to me, and then we'll go from there. So um, I definitely um, took about a day or two just to return the paperwork for her. Um, I thought on it a little bit. I said, why not? Um, at that time, I was ready to change. At that time, I was I was you know ready for the transition to just be. You know, I, I have a little brother as well and a little sister, so I have to you know I was never the, the proper role model for them. So going forward, I wanted to become that proper role model, um, and this was just a you know, great opportunity to become that. So um, Maria connected me with um, Operation Exit, the Resilient Coders program, and then from there, I just traveled through numerous internships um, that were funded through my brother's keeper and um, the city level as well. 
So would you say that my brother's keeper was the ones who helped you change your behavior and your norms? Whereas though you can sit behind that? Yes, I would definitely say you street people, you have to change behavior and your norms. I would definitely say um, my brother's keeper has changed my life for the better. It's instilled those opportunities in me that I never thought I'd be able to um, be exposed to. Um, you know, working for, for a state representative, working in a legislator, learning how to write laws and bills now. Um, yes, my brother's keeper has had a, a heavy impact on me in, in, in my transition from just becoming you know, a drug dealer to a legislative aide now. I want to check the room and I want to make sure we're, we're balancing out in our responses. So does the next question, if I would love for it to be directed towards Kim to make sure her voice is equal with the others. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. She had her hand up first. No, 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 you go ahead. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Dana Arviso with Potlatch Fund. Um, and we are a Native American foundation based in Seattle. And uh, one of the areas that we fund in is called Healthy Pathways for Native Youth. Um, and it started out with us funding a number of the canoes that are on the water every summer um, in the Puget Sound area and along the Salish Sea. So it's youth getting the opportunity to be in um, some of the cedar canoes out on the water as part of a canoe family, and then traveling from tribal community to tribal community. Um, so my question is that, you know, just in my experience of being out on the water with youth, you know, in a canoe, that there's, um, they're really, really observant. And especially in going through some of the different waterways, I mean, there's opportunities to land in Tacoma, where the water looks very, very different um, because it's a port and there's a lot of leakage um, you know, of oil and things in the water compared to if you go through the San Juan Islands where the water is really, really pristine. Um, and so what I've observed is just that it's really grown into the health of the water and making them really feel much more passionate about being an environmental steward. So I'm curious about in the cultural exchange and having the opportunity to be in such completely different environments um, like Los Angeles and Alaska if the if that experience led to conversations around kind of environmental justice or just the health of the land and water of course oh my goodness <laughs> so fresh tracks during the uh, expedition oh my goodness this I like your question. <laughs> Required a little bit of setup, but <laughs> so um, the Los Angeles group and the Alaska cohort, we went to Arctic Village, and Arctic Village is in the Anwar region, which is the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Mm -hmm. So I don't think anyone from Los Angeles actually knew what the refuge was, but when we got there, they started to learn about the importance of the land because the refuge is like this beautiful place full of wildlife, trees, just, I love it. <laughs> and on the north slope, the refuge has polar bears, whales, polar bears, just beautiful. But what I'm trying to get to is that we got connected to it because we visited the place. And when we got to Alaska, the Los Angeles crew, they started to ask questions about why is walleye so important to the refuge? And why, sh why should we protect it too? So we, once we got there, the community members started to talk about the importance of the land. So I think that that connection with the Los Angeles people and the local people from Arctic Village, they got that connection. So now they have, now they know that they should stand with protecting the land. And also, I work with the Inuit Circumpolar Council, and which has to deal with like climate change and all that stuff. And what they try to do is they, a bunch of researchers, they come to Alaska because they want to like do. I don't want to say invade, but that's kind of what they're doing. They want to take over. They want to um, go to the native lands and do a bunch of research, but they don't get permission from anyone, like any community members. So the Inuit Circumpolar Council, they're trying to put more indigenous rep like representation into it, and also youth. So that's
of another project that I'm starting to work on. You had a question? I, my, mine was really a comment. I just wanted to say, I'm Joyce from Tulsa, Joyce McClellan from Tulsa, Oklahoma. And, Where it's 80 um, degrees. I'm sorry? Where it's 80 degrees. Was it, is, did you ask the question <laughs> this morning? It's, about six, six, <laughs> today, but, um, it's warmer, but uh, this is my first time in Aspen, and I absolutely love it. Uh, but I wanted to say, you, each one of you are incredible leaders in your own right. I've been really impressed. Thank you for sharing your failures and your successes, that says a lot. For you all to stand before a group of people that you don't know, that are older than you, for I think everybody in here may be older than you guys, but to talk about uh, what you're passionate about, what your successes were, and or what your aspirations are, but certainly just walking us through some of your failures. I mean, that, that says a lot about who you are, and it tells us that you're on your path. You're on your path, and I commend you, and keep going, because you guys will see you nationally, I'm sure. We'll see your name and see your faces nationally. But the point I wanted to make was, please tell us before we leave today how we can continue to define young men and women like you guys. How can we go back to our communities and, and find those aspiring leaders that don't quite know that they're leaders yet, but we've got the, the secret sauce <laughs> to kind of open the door for them uh, because we've got the programs, we, we've got the opportunities and the resources. How do we go back and find more of you guys? Uh, I just want to uh, Israel, you were talking and Israel was like, hmm. You can't see Israel's name tag. Israel has a, a key, he's got a, a crown over his name and a dollar sign is for S. He's got his made of the dollar sign. So I, when I noticed that, I thought, oh, this young man is not playing. <laughs> He's serious. It was, uh, but no, it was, this is probably a funny way to answer the question, but I would probably say go home and find the knuckleheads mm -hmm. and give them an opportunity to be honest. Because when people are at their lowest point and like they don't know what is next, they just want to get out of that pain. They don't want to hurt them, you know? They want to like find something that would change the perspective, change their life pretty much. That opportunity, the whole point of us is doing, you know, opportunity youth and helping out the people. You know, don't look for the rock stars. Don't get, you know, they have their pathway. Obviously, we'll, we'll bring them in too. But, you know, go look for the knuckleheads. Where do we find them? To build off what Israel was saying, um, it's that, you know, that, that boots on the ground effect where you just have to go into these neighborhoods yeah. in which you feel like it's, it's being heavily underserved, is you know, is criminal activity is large. Um, these, these, they're not graduated from college. You know, these folks that are, are really experiencing something in which their their counterparts in, in other neighborhoods, the, the suburbs, are not experiencing. Um, go in these communities, get with them on a, on a real basis, and say, listen, what is it do I need to give to you to make you you know change your lifestyle to feel that I'm here to support you for your development going forward. Um, and th and that, that was that for me. Maria was that, you know, boots on the ground person who came into my neighborhood and said, Debbie, you are more than just dealing drugs. Um, you are a leader in, in the making. Um, so, yes, it's that, just that effort. That effort has to be, you know, stronger on your behalf to let them know that, okay, um, I can persuade her to change me. Um, and, and, and growing up in a neighborhood, growing up in the hood, we were definitely shy of, of change. Um, you know, I, I didn't want to talk to, you know, my local official, but now I can pick up my phone and call the captain and say, hey, captain. How we doing today? Um, so that just that feel is kind of awesome now. Do we have street cred now that we we heard your story and, and we can go into the community and just say, hey, I'm here to help you change your life. Uh, I see a bigger leader in you. I mean, what conversation do we have to get them to hear us? You have to bring that relevance. Um, you always have to relate to anybody's situation. Um, and my situation was definitely something, you know. So for instance, um. I definitely want to, you know, put out there that my mom did everything she needed to do. Um, she put me through great schooling, but it's that, you know, it's that aspect where you, you definitely don't listen to your parents and you, you, you go out in the neighborhood and do what you, you want to do on your own behalf. Um, so with that being said, uh, Maria knew who my mom was. She knew who my mom you know, instilled into me, and she was like, listen, this is not who your, your parent raised you to be. Um, for other brothers like myself, it's, you know, the, the, the local officials who, who looked at, who were like, you know, who are arresting us to come to just talk to us, you know? Um, you know, and for instance, the, the major issue is now is the police know not representing the, the community they serve. 
um, and, and, and not you know, pardon, second chances, the power of second chances. Um, you can definitely arrest me just for you know, selling drugs in, in front of the store, or you can say, listen, Devin, you're more than selling drugs in front of the store. I don't want to arrest you, so I want you to walk away from this, but I also want you to look into something better that's going to better yourself. So yeah, that's how it works. I will take one additional question, and, and then we'll ask the, I'll ask the rest of the questions we follow up with our leaders uh, afterwards, we're going to get into our, our, our final activity and after this question and then uh, enjoy the rest of our afternoon. Great. I'm Kathy uh, from Del Mar County, California, which is Oregon border on the coast. And we're with adjacent tribal lands. So we work with the adjacent tribal lands. I, I have a very technical question about fresh tracks. I, we've heard a little bit about cultural exchange and we heard a little bit about West Virginia train, the trainer. Mm -hmm. Can you? Give us the lay of the land about fresh tracks and how it works. And it seems like these guys were train train trainers that were trained. Yes. And and what's your expectation of them afterwards? And how do they get selected? Can you give us sure. sort of an overview of that? So I will absolutely follow up with you afterwards okay. to give you a more detailed <laughs> overview. But very quickly, uh, in 2016, there was a two-week uh, expedition. Uh, and that's the word used for it. It sounds like a, just a trip, but the core elements of the training that were involved in that were sessions developed by the Natural Leaders Network, which is an initiative of the Children and Nature, Children and Nature Network uh, that uh, circle around developing a personal narrative and using it for change, uh, civic engagement, community organizing, community stewardship, and outdoor uh, recreation or outdoor exploration, which uh, includes, Kimberly didn't mention, but it includes the rock climbing uh, at REI. I don't know if that was your favorite moment, but it wasn't. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, but so it, it, was, it was based on those, those the train, there was a training that's at the core of that experience that's based on those core elements. Uh, following that, uh, the development of those leaders, uh, some of those leaders were representatives at the Roosevelt Room in December, speaking on an uh, intergovernmental uh, roundtable on diverse youth in the outdoors. Uh, Kimberly was a speaker for uh, that as well. So that continued the development in the program. And then out of the 13 participants in that program, in that initial pilot program, eight of them returned as trainers. So they led the curriculum that they themselves were participants in and led the training for that uh, under the guidance of, nat under, of natural leaders, uh, of the mentors in the Natural Leaders Network. And so Kimberly served as a trainer uh, for uh, the rest of the gentlemen on uh, the panel. Uh, so that's a brief uh, timeline of the program. In terms of details of how folks are, uh, apply, are accepted, uh, there are gentlemen in here who can give you uh, an immense more amount of details. Juan Martinez, the director of Fresh Tracks, is sitting in the back. If you'd raise your hand. And Martin LeBlanc, who is someone who is key to the founding of it, is, is also in the room. Uh, other partners, Eric Stegman with Center for Native American Youth and Bettina uh, Gonzalez with Generation Indigenous and Center for Native American Youth and Mark Breka from REI are also in the room. So there you have a wealth of knowledge of the structure of the program to, to ask if you all would like to add something to that. Uh, for now, I'll, I'll just add one of, one of the things about Fresh Track is that we're, and why we're here is that we're looking to partner and really break out of the silo. So we come from a very uh, environmental steward and conservation steward of the lands and public uh, federal lands um, to, to conserve and preserve that feature of the legacy of the land. But we're looking at opportunity youth and partnerships with my brother Speaker and Center for Native American Youth as their two primary anchors of partnerships where we can identify young leaders programs across the country that are going to help us identify where we can be and where Fresh Tracks can be an amplifier for the work that's already being developed there. Um, so if you're interested and feel uh, if this resonates and is something that would be of benefit to your community, please don't hesitate to come up to us afterwards and we can talk more in depth. I, I, I just say as a, like a venture capitalist, as a funder in Fresh Tracks, you know, the the three or four things that I see reaffirmed through Fresh Tracks are that experiences in the outdoors can be life transforming um, on multiple levels. You know, I think of climbing the rock wall, maybe that wasn't the most fun thing, but you know, you get in the outdoors and, and, and you're, you're faced with constant challenges, 
you're intimidated and you get past those, you have these micro successes, right? And so you have this accumulation of doing things that you never thought you could ever do before, and you start to build this muscle of confidence, which is foundational to future success. And the, the success comes in multiple flavors. So you have experiences under the stars where you realize how you yourself sort of connect to broader society and the environment. You have these experiences in a kayak where you team with people and you realize the value of teamwork. And then you have these experiences that make you sweat. And so you realize the value of just getting outside for your physical health. So the outdoors is this learning environment and it helps you mature, grow physically, spiritually, in terms of your appreciation for community and for family. So it's a, I mean, it's a, it's one of the, my team at Houston is here, you know, one of the investments we make that we're most proud of. I'll just make it real quick. I just want to say, being part of Fresh Tracks in the beginning, these four young people represent a cohort of young people that we've learned more from than we've taught. Um, and you guys are always, and the one thing they've given, I always say, is your most precious resource is time. You guys have given so much time for this project over the years. And I also just want to give a real credit to REI. When you start something like this, obviously, they're taking a chance. And as a funder, they really took a chance on Fresh Tracks. I think you can kind of see right here um, some of that impact. The other group I just want to really thank is uh, President Obama. And um, he hasn't been mentioned a lot today, but if you see Michael Smith later, they really took a chance and helped this move forward. Um, and the thing is, they've stayed involved since. Um, since, I mean, you know, Kimberly was at the White House in December, but they've stayed involved through MBK, they're staying involved through the Obama Foundation. So that kind of support and diversity of partners that we have in the Native program really helps. Yeah, and apologies for not acknowledging Kristen and Casey Six Glitch on their own side. Also, uh, program partners and supporters. Uh, the, uh, thank you for your questions. Again, if you have additional questions, I pointed out some of the key partners in the room in terms of program partners. Uh, if you have questions for our, our leaders, you can link up with them uh, the rest of today and tomorrow as well. And please do. Uh, please connect with them, network, support, things like that. Um, right now, we're going to, to close off our, our session. We wanted to make sure that this was at, uh, get even more into it being a community discussion. And we want to mimic some of the uh, one of the activities that we do uh, with uh, our with the youth that we train with the leaders in the program. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to split into table four table conversations table conversations for the next uh, ten minutes, uh, centered around three important questions. And I referenced developing a personal narrative and using it for change. But another key component of the program is the community action plans and what folks do when they return to their community. So. At, our tra at the trainings at Fresh Tracks, uh, the trainers facilitate a uh, process where the youth go through a community action plan and develop based on their passions, the thing that they know, their community, and those needs that they are very familiar with. They develop a plan for some, an action, that a positive action they can have, and they're supported by the trainers from the Natural Leaders Network uh, for a minimum a year uh, financially, by a stipend, community action stipend for a year, and then that connection goes on even afterwards, uh, all the way through life. Um, but this activity is going to be around our, your community, your nature story, your outdoor story, and then how uh, the outdoors can be used as a platform or a partner uh, to enforce some of the action you are trying to enact in your community. So I'm gonna ask our leaders to, to go ahead and be uh, table captains for these conversations. Uh, we have 10 minutes and then we'll, go, we'll wrap up and close up with a uh, spoken word from Trenton to end the afternoon. Uh, so, speak up. Thank you for participating with your ears and now you get a chance to participate with your voice. All right, I'm going to write the main questions on the board. See, again, how are we doing today? Shout out Generation Indigenous. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for them. <laughs> Yes. Nice.
six mile hike. I'm not sure. Six miles. <laughs> <laughs> it felt like six miles. We went to Aces. I'm sorry. We, we took a shot to Aces and we walked back. How long is that? I don't know. Then it fell fast. I don't know how long it was. It wasn't six miles, though. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's not six miles, but it's very tedious. You know, one in which we felt like we were going to fall off the cliff about every five to ten minutes. It's very challenging. Yes. I'm from San Diego, so I've never been. Uh, I've never been to spend much time in Denver at all, and now Aspen. I've never been, so it's been so I want to try to go this afternoon. Yeah. Well, so I was asking where you went. So like, you want to go? Um, it's actually called Aces. Um, it's like a, I believe they're in a rescue. Yeah, they're in a rescue. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
What's that? <laughs> I think it's important to involve youth in our favorite outdoor activities because it helps them understand their connection to the land and protecting waterways, even in the city, because it's all one system. Dad, your brother. It means I'm a it means you help him out when you call him a cat. He's in my house. Yeah. 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 And so, uh, Jason and Charger have always had the idea to so get a group of kids together. We started off running to the, um, to the office of the Corps of Engineers, the director, so they did that. And I was at the If I walk with Maspin, that might be the thing that I that I put most of my energy on. So thank you. Thank you. Um, touch a little bit bases on the street record program. Um, that is something in which partner if there's family members that are struggling out there to put their kids through um, after school and um, if there's um family members struggling to, to just maybe take care of their kid and, and, and have a you know a male come in and say yep. a male presence be in their life, um that, that goes also a long way. But um the street worker program is something in which was great because I, as I said it's boots on the ground. You know, it's, you're actually you're coming into these neighborhoods that are heavily targeted by you know, the law enforcement, um, that are heavily shown on the media day in, day out. No, I know. Saying, um, listen, do you want to go on a hike? You know, your brothers want to go on a hike. And for you to come and ask me something like that, it'll be very foreign, but I have to think about it. And I say, wow, he, he's, he's willing to invite me to this hike for me and my brother. So yes, I am definitely willing to take that on. Yep. And it's a new opportunity. I'm not going to you know, just down it because it's a new opportunity that's coming from you, but I understand you're trying to foster the relationship part. Well, I'm trying to build the leadership from within my program, right? So what my, all our guys are 18, 21 year olds. They dropped out of high school, they're coming back and doing great things. So they're already there. So now that's what I was trying to get to. So it um, they reached out to me and I'm at the Snapchat, Instagram, what's your name? One minute, I'm going to, you know, um, do the, the little poem. There you go. It's really powerful. Yeah. Yeah. Mind if you get you guys can record this, it's fine. And so, like I was saying, um, 
in my hometown, a, a group of my friends, Jason Lynn Charger and Joseph White Eyes and Robin Laveau, even though she's older, we, we formed the One Mind Youth Movement, which was initially in response to a, a you know, a, a suicide epidemic that was happening and is still happening, but it turned into, you know, the youth movement that, that, that launched, or at least helped launch the, the resistance at Standing Rock, you know, from the Dakota Access Pipeline. And, um, you know, unfortunately we failed. They completed the pipeline and it's flowing under the Missouri River right now. Um, hopefully not, but slowly but surely polluting the water that we use, you know, in my hometown and all the way down to Missouri. Um, I was arrested on the front lines on October 27th, and it was in the North Treaty Camp because that's on treaty territory. And so whenever the runners ran to D.C., they were having people sign a petition saying, you know, this land that the pipeline crosses through is unceded ter treaty territory of the Fort Laramie Treaty of 1851. You know, and they had over like 250,000 signatures or something like that. And um, so, I mean, it should have been apparent, you know, people agreed with us that that was our treaty territory. And so we set up a camp there directly in the path of the pipeline. And on October 27th, the militarized police and National Guard, they raided that camp, and they used very aggressive force, shooting people with rubber bullets, um, you know, macing us, tear gas, concussion grenades. Uh, I never heard anything like that in my life. In my underwear, arrested me. I went to jail like that. I didn't get any of my clothes or, or anything back from that day. Um, and so that was really spiritually traumatizing for me. And um, I had to let it out somehow. And so I wrote a poem, you know, and it helps me. I, I apologize if I have to stop. I get really emotional when I share this. But um, so it's called Mini Wichoni, which translates to water is life in, in Lakota. And so without further ado, like I said, I'm not a rapper, I'm a, I'm a messenger. And these are the words that I have to share with you. <sighs> See, I've been thinking, I need to pass this message with the right rhymes. I've been living low key, not like a life in the limelight. I wonder, was the time right? I'm focused on the moment. They're still trying to drill these pipelines where sacred water's flowing. And I know I cannot just let it go. It's a struggle every day, I'm going crazy. Really wish I wasn't troubled. If you're living in some ignorance, you need to pop that bubble. It's a puzzle. If we don't solve it, our country's gonna crumble on the double. Just listen, please, I've got the time to stand and talk. I could tell a story about my arrest at Standing Rock. What really makes me mad is peaceful people shot by laughing cops just for occupying space to try to make construction stop. You see these corporations, all they care about is money. It, it isn't funny. If you think it is, then you're a dummy. Think about your family. Reality is a tragedy. I feel the need to change the world before it's a catastrophe. Now I turned 21, but I still see the need to unify. Just understand that this life we're living is do or die. We need to realize that we survived the genocide. I cannot hide the fact that I am grateful that I've been alive. Innocent people arrested just because of the money invested. It is an equal in fact. Even my freedom is being contested. We fight for the water is precious. You gotta believe this moment is destined, giving it back to all the oppressors. I think it's time that we teach them a lesson. My ammunition is li lyrics written uniquely. You've got opinions, I understand this completely. But you need to listen, this truth I'm spitting will lift you into remission of the system we're living in and it's easy. Why should we listen? They're not respecting the treaties. These people are evil, they pulled me out the Yanipi. They call it business, it's sacrilegious. I've witnessed the sickness and it's ridiculous. My forgiveness is freaky. Mini Bichoni. That's awesome. <laughs> so, I'd just like to point out one more thing. Um, this has been a great event that we had in here, you know, had a good time. But honestly, I've been feeling really conflicted this whole time because of something I found out last night. And, okay, so you guys know the Coke brothers, you know, this is the Coke building that we're in. Um, I, I found out last night that they secretly uh, funded and lobbied the construction of the Dakota Access Pipeline. Wow. Meaning they're profiting off it right now. And I'm standing in this hour and a half of your time, of your energy, of your intent focus, and your uh, willingness to contribute to the conversation. Again, follow up with uh, our, the le program leaders and with uh, program leaders in terms of people who help plan it, and then program leaders in terms of uh, those who will help carry it forward uh, after we leave here. So thank you. Thank you again. Thank you.